This is Bobby McCutcheon from King Street Library, and I'm here with Mr. Jack Whiteside at the Williamsburg Regional Airport. So thrilled to be here today. Mr. Jack manages the airport, and he will tell you he knows absolutely nothing about an airplane. We'll talk to that person in a minute. But Mr. Jack takes care of making sure this airport functions, and he knows a great deal about that, how that happens. Is there anything you'd like the little kids to know about an airport? Well, I think the uh, children should be aware that from this airport you can go anywhere you want to go, not commercially flying, but with a private plane, large or small. There are ultralights, which are some very small planes that only weigh a few hundred pounds, and there are planes that come in here that weigh a good many tons. And uh, the, the airport runway is a mile long. The taxiway next to it is where the airplane propels itself on the ground to get to the end of the runway to take off or propels itself to come back to the apron. The apron is the area near the uh, terminal building, which is where we're standing. Uh, where they park the plane. As a matter of fact, there's one parked right over there. You might turn your camera where you can see it. That, that plane is parked on the apron, which is next to the terminal building. So we invite children to come and visit the airport. We have a lot we could show you. A lot of it's technical, but a lot of it is not. And I think they would be interested. They would be interested. Um, we thank you so much for letting us visit here today. Glad to have you. And we'll be back many times. All right, very good. And if you need us, call us. We'll, certainly, we'll come certainly. Talk I, to I, go to the, I go to the you library to regularly. Yes. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> this is Bobby McCutcheon. I'm from the Williamsburg County Library, where I do special programming. And I'm here with Mr. John Hudson at the Williamsburg Regional Airport, where we're going to learn a little bit about being a pilot, being a lover of being a pilot, being a lover of airplanes and what those planes can do for you. Um, first thing, we're gonna find out what an airplane is. Now, you know a bird has a nose, has a tail, has wings, and I think that's probably where people got the idea they could fly one day. They don't look like birds anymore. They look like this creature behind us. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? We're looking at a uh, Cessna 172. Um, and actually the bird concept comes from uh, a fellow that lived a long time ago, a fellow by the name of Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci said, once man has tasted the gift of flight and looked down from the heavens, he will always long to be there. And that is exactly the way it is. Uh, the aircraft, just like a bird, has wings. It's got the nose. <laughs> it has the tail feathers. And uh, so it's the same design. What's and this thing, John? That is a, that, this area here, this is the propeller. And the engine, which is located in here, this is a section of it turns this propeller and of course the word propeller just simply means it propels you not all aircraft have propellers some of them have uh, turbine or jet engines and uh, that's mostly your commercial or uh, some of our crop dusters have it but on most of the small aircraft you'll always see a propeller and it literally pulls it through the air and uh, that you get your thrust off of the engine you get your uh, pull off of your propeller uh, to move you both down the runway and also into the air but the main part of an airplane is not the propeller it's not the engine it's the wings because there is things called low pressure and high pressure the top of the wing is shaped so that it's low pressure in other words it'll almost be like a vacuum on top but when the nose of the airplane comes up, then there's high pressure here. Well, if you've got high pressure here and you've got low pressure here, that means you're going to go up. It's all about mathematics. And so it was designed to be able to lift a certain amount of weight and to accomplish uh, uh, certain feats. Now, I was asked earlier why some aircraft are high wing 
and some are low wing. It's mostly because of the jobs that they do. Now, an airplane's not a toy. It's a piece of equipment like a farmer's uh, tractor, like a uh, logger's uh, log equipment in the woods or a truck. An airplane is a piece of equipment, and that's the way we treat it. It gets a certain job done, whether to transport somebody from here to uh, see some relatives or a vacation spot, or whether it's to haul somebody injured from here, from King Street uh, Airport to uh, a medical center, um, or going into a mission area, uh, places of remote areas where nobody can get food, nobody can get uh, supplies without an aircraft. And there's a lot more of those places today in 2021 than you can imagine. So the aircraft is designed specifically for a certain task. You're leaning on this. Strut. What is, what does it do? This is a strut. Mm -hmm. uh, some aircraft have them, some don't. We have one and hangar two built about like this one that does not have a strut. This is a piece of metal that hooks to the wing and hooks to the fuselage structure, which right here is your strongest part. And it hooks in the bottom, and when it does, it helps hold that wing solid. And it makes the aircraft lighter because they don't have to have a lot of overbuild or, or a lot more metal in it. So that part, the middle, the body, you call a fuselage. It's fuselage. Why is it called a fuselage? Well, it's called a fuselage because it's literally a scientific term dealing with a, uh, a, a, a carrier, a support, a, um, uh, the way that the structure is manufactured. And so it, and a fuselage starts right here at this point, And it goes to the front of the, the tail right here. And so this piece of is really strong. And it's built that way so that it can carry the weight. And you also have to be uh, concerned in engineering with uh, uh, G-force, which is the gravitational force against something. Now we've got a science class going on. But this aircraft, when it's flying level, will have less force against it than when it turns. When it turns, then the pressure of the wind pushes up or it'll be pushing down on it. And so this fuselage has got to be able to uh, move. All right, in the back, what does this do and what's it called? Let me operate that part for you. This is called a flap. And does this one on this side and the right go at the same time? They go at the same time. This here adds lift. Cause you see, we went from having this much room back to here. When we drop this, we come here and now we divert the air downward. Of your yoke in, this is called a yoke. And so the yoke will go left or right. So depending on how steep of a turn I want to make this is a two minute turn coordinator if I wanted to make a turn to look at a certain area out of this aircraft then for my ailerons and my um, everything would be straight I would turn it a little and to keep this ball in the middle the ball has to stay in the middle then I would use my rudder which is my feet operating down here to keep that ball where, I belong, where it belongs in the middle and I'm making a safe turn. Now if I want to go up and I'm sitting here in the cockpit then I pull back on that elevator and that turns me and my nose of the airplane starts flying upward. If I decide I need to go down I just push in on it and it 
turns my airplane and I start downward. Now, I'll tell you what, we'll take another science class. How's that? That's fine. Okay. This here is my turn coordinator. It tells me if I'm turning too steep or I'm not turning steep enough. The ball will roll around. Very simple. This here is an airspeed. This tells me how fast I'm actually moving through the air uh, that I'm facing. Now, uh, a piece here for those that want to become uh, science related or medical. This is called a Bernoulli principle. Bernoulli was a uh, clergy uh, many hundred years ago, and he developed the Bernoulli, Bernoulli tube, uh, which allows air to flow through a section or water throw through a section at a faster or slower rate of speed. This gauge, this gauge, this gauge all operate off of uh, science that's uh, over 500 years old and it's still working. This is our vertical speed. It tells me how fast I'm going up or how fast I'm going down. This here is our um, altimeter and I can turn it over here to 29.92 which is sea level and right now our airport uh, for an airplane coming in is 200 feet below um, the barometric pressure and so we turn it up here to where we get to 67 feet and uh, our barometric pressure is uh, 30 .2 something and so that tells us how close we are getting to the to the ground uh, for touchdown or takeoff and it also tells us how thin and how thick the air is which is very important this here's a glide slope uh, if we were in the dark or in bad weather, we would use this, we would use this, and that would, and then we'd use uh, this here to tell us how far off the ground we are. We would use this to make sure that we're lined up properly on the runway. Because a pilot can actually, uh, what they call an IFR, Instrument Certified uh, Flight uh, Regulations, why a pilot can actually come in in total pitch black using these two instruments with these others here that's in here and uh, land down on the runway and uh, go home and that's totally pitch black or totally bad weather where you can't even see what's in front of you then we come over here and we've got radio stacks uh, when flying an airplane, you have to have all types of communications, both with the FAA, both with other aircraft, and also with uh, where you're going and what you're doing, or if the um, uh, FAA or the air traffic controller needs to contact you, that's what all of this is about. Uh, you guys, you kids can probably operate this better than most pilots, uh, I know, because you understand electronics much better. These here tells us how much fuel we've got on board, oil pressure, oil temperature. Uh, this here is how much electricity we've got. And this here is just how many RPMs our engine's turning. Because when you're taking off, while this airplane will be over here at 2700, when it's coming in, it'll be over here because we're trying to slow down and put her on the ground. All kinds of little instruments and throttles that gives us power this here able to as you change another science class is when you're taking off uh, from a, uh, one area and you're climbing to 5,000 feet the air's thinner at that 5,000 feet so you have to lean your mixture out in other words less fuel the higher you go the less fuel you burn and then if we were to go on up to 10, 15,000 feet, we'd have to lean it again. But when we start coming back down to earth, we have to start reaching it up. And that's the way that happens there. Um, a lot of little gadgets and buttons and things. No, if you can tell us, 
you weren't born in an airplane, I assume, no. and probably didn't go to grade school in an airplane. Right. So how did you get to be associated with airplanes? When did you start flying and caring for them? Can you tell us that? Yeah. Uh, my name is John Hudson. Uh, I'm a uh, FAA pilot. I'm a FAA um, maintenance inspector, safety inspector. Um, I sit on the board of several aviation ministries and also have a ministry of our own. But all of that, I think, started back when I was just a child because I used to always look up in the skies and see those streaks and I was wondering where the aircraft was going to and who was on board. Um, a friend of mine, I was working with Eastman Kodak, and a friend of mine invited me to go with him on a missions trip, and I did. At that time, I uh, met a pilot uh, who was the same age as I am, and we've been friends since 1985. And he sits on my board, and I sit on one of his boards. Um, but he was a bush pilot flying food, uh, cargo, and uh, medical supplies into uh, remote villages in Mexico and Central America. And then uh, it was also an air ambulance. He had a plane just like this here. And we'd pull the seats out of it and fix it to where we could lay people down. At, uh, a hospital by ground was three days away. By airplane, it was about 45 minutes. So that worked out well for us. But uh, I met him, got talking to him, and, and I grew up on a farm, a beef farm in East Tennessee. And we still have that farm in our family. And uh, from that, uh, I learned to work on stuff, fix stuff. Um, I went on, and I felt like the Lord was calling me uh, and opened up doors of opportunity for me to be involved in aviation missions, which I helped them fix their airplanes. And little did we know that one day the door of opportunity would open to us and we'd step through, not only to work on missionary aircraft, but to be able to work on general aviation, which is everybody's plane, and also to um, uh, own aircraft. But what brought us there was we saw a need and nobody could meet that need. Um, aviation is a real nice commodity, but it's expensive too. It can be expensive. So we filled the gap in, and in filling that gap in, we did for missions what most people couldn't do, uh, whether it was in South America, Central America. Uh, we even have aircraft flying in Hudson Bay, Canada. Uh, we have aircraft that we've serviced flying in Alaska, and we have a sister ministry in uh, Anchorage that uh, works with a group called Samaritan's Purse, a Billy Graham ministry outreach. So you just never know when you look up in the sky and you see streaks and you wonder where they're going, you never know where they're going to take you. Just be faithful and step through the doors when they open. <laughs>